Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, for joining us here. And sorry for being late, but uh, we had a heated internal discussion about uh, CBDC, and uh, would be interesting to talk about it now, but could not, so it delayed me. So thanks uh, for joining us here and uh, for giving us the opportunity to move a bit outside of the normal discussion about uh, monetary policy. And uh, it's a great pleasure to host an event uh, which tries to offer a different angle uh, to it. Uh, for those who are here, I don't need to convince you that a different angle is needed. I just uh, remind you that, how to say, that an angle of the past or monetary policy had uh, uh, confronted uh, 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 quite I important uh, persons uh, from uh, uh, at, this, at this time, uh, Irving Fisher, who in uh, 1929, uh, how to say, was fully convinced, you know, that there, there's no crisis looming, everything will be fine. And you had two uh, people from uh, the Austrian economics part of it, uh, including, of course, uh, uh, von Hayek over from Bavaku said, listen, I'm afraid that we have a crisis looming and it arrived there. So for me, it is a reason to open uh, a spectrum for alternative, uh, alternative voices. And such a voice we have here to hear how other people think about monetary policy as it is uh, in order to uh, give room uh, to a differentiated thinking. Uh, and uh, I could talk much more, but since I used my time up there, I will give uh, the floor immediately uh, to mix uh, pronunciation. I hope it's called Rangeli. 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 Good. Uh, thanks a lot. I uh, was not clear what was uh, pronounced there. Uh, Max Rangeli, uh, uh, who, I would say, has uh, uh, a position in which he tries to uh, on the one hand, interact uh, with politicians, on the other hand, I to say, to offer him a possibility to uh, introduce new thoughts to politics. And uh, when I go through the comments which has been done, that he has, the, uh, has been a, a, a think, he founded a think tank, uh, uh, and run a think tank uh, uh, founded by a British member of parliament since 2014 and has since joined the boards of other think tanks in London and Brussels. Besides uh, focusing on Austrian School of Economics, uh, the future of money has also organized a blockchain summit uh, in the European Parliament, uh, the first of this kind in the world, and he organized uh, and moderated the future of artificial intelligence roundtable discussion in the European Parliament. So uh, he has been quite busy, so I'm um, uh, looking forward to what he's saying to us. As I'm quite stressed uh, today, I won't be able to stay here too long. I have to run to giving a talk myself at a different uh, institution here at the Central European University on the normalization of money. Uh, it's a pity how to say you cannot join us, or you could actually, if I show up there, I don't think uh, they uh, will ask for it. Uh, so looking forward to you, I invite you. I hope I can, within the first 10 minutes, get the a glimpse on it, what you are doing there, and then I'm going to leave you. Wish you all the best, and uh, I took the pleasure of also offering a little refreshment after this, so you can stick together, because I see a number of people have seen before. So all the best. Thank you much. Max, you have the floor. How do you get the slides to uh, show on the screen? Yes, here they are. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, for the kind introduction. And uh, so I think the Austrian school really has the capacity to explain a lot of what's happened in recent years in terms of bubbles, uh, inflation, uh, distortions in the bond markets, and also another, a number of other factors but what we're going to go through today is uh, not just the era of 0% interest rates and QE, 
but actually the last 40 years or so of monetary policy, uh, which I think has been uh, leading up to a lot of these factors that we're seeing today. And so very quick intro uh, then to the Cobden Centre. Uh, as the Governor said, uh, it was founded by a British Member of Parliament. Um, we do quite a lot of seminars on the Austrian School, uh, including uh, the Bank of England at the OECD and elsewhere in the European Parliament. Uh, and we've written, uh, written some quite interesting works on this. We're currently working on two books to be published by Springer as well. Um, and we also, we don't just uh, work with the Austrian school, we also uh, look at some other areas of interest. For instance, uh, we organise the Artificial Intelligence Roundtable discussions in the European Parliament, as well as quite a few other events on emerging technologies. And so, perhaps one that was of particular interest, given the current discussions around central bank digital currencies, was also the European Parliament Blockchain Summit, which we organised in 2016. And at that we had pretty much all of the global institutions attending, um, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN and so on, as well as uh, central banks and regulators, and as well as a lot of blockchain startups, of course. We had the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. So actually, the, the, one of the previous talks I gave here uh, at the National Bank in 2019 was on the future of money. Um, but it's worth just bearing in mind some of this, actually, because I suspect when the latest round of, of debt accumulation over the last few years uh, begins to blow up, there'll be more and more talk about uh, what type of monetary system we should move towards. And so a lot of the data which I'll be talking through today was used in a book that I wrote last year with uh, UK Member of Parliament Steve Baker and he's the only Austrian school MP in the UK and at the time was the longest serving MP on the Treasury Select Committee which is responsible for questioning the Governor of the Bank of England and the main regulators and so on. So this book uh, builds in a lot of our experiences uh, over the last 10 years or more in this area and we look at the last generation or so of asset bubbles, of distortions to the bond markets, and we look at how monetary policy has led to a lot of this. And we actually wrote this book to be free for anybody to download, so it can be downloaded online. And we've had a lot of good feedback, including from a former chief economist at the Bank for International Settlements and the late Lord Lawson, uh, who, uh, who passed away this year who was the uh, Chancellor under Margaret Thatcher. He gave us a very, uh, a very kind testimonial. Uh, so if you find the data today interesting, uh, that book can be found online uh, for free. And we also, one of the things which may be of interest while we're talking about the nature of money, uh, we organized the, uh, the parliamentary debate in 2014 on the monetary system, on how uh, banks create money and how this might be reformed. Uh, so that was the first of its kind since the mid-19th century, since the, the time of uh, Prime Minister Robert Peel. And uh, that may well be an interesting, uh, let's say, adjunct discussion to what we're going to be going through today. And so on to the core part of the discussion then, which is the nature of the Austrian school and how it explains modern financial crises. So first off, I'll uh, spend maybe th three slides or so talking through so that we can understand what the Austrian school hypothesizes. And then we'll look at data from the last generation of policies uh, and do some hypothesis testing. So Friedrich von Hayek won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1974, in part for his work on business cycles. And I think it's one of the most important areas of economics that we can understand in the 21st century. I think it leads to a lot of the phenomena that we have to deal with at the moment, and not just inflation, uh, but a lot of other areas as well. And so at its core is this idea that uh, interest rates are a pricing mechanism in the economy, similar to other pricing mechanisms, and should be set by the market rather than by bureaucratic committees, in this case, central banks. So we could look at how 
the setting of prices by governments has failed in, in pretty much all other sectors uh, in previous decades. For example, uh, in the 1970s, the government in Britain set all kinds of prices, uh, not just rents, but even things like the prices that hairdressers could charge, for instance. And of course, it caused havoc in the economy. Uh, so very rarely would you have economists in this day and age suggesting that the price of food uh, or consumer goods or fuel uh, should be, the prices of those should be set uh, by government committees rather than by the market. So in essence, the Austrian school applies this to interest rates as well. Uh, so if we think about, for instance, uh, let's take the price of coffee, for instance, because this will relate to how we think about interest rates. If there is a shortage of coffee, uh, the price goes up uh, to reflect that. And that, of course, has a number of different effects. Uh, so first of all, it disincentivizes the consumption of coffee, uh, whatever good there happens to be a shortage in. Uh, but additionally, that increase in price also incentivizes producers to bring more to market. Uh, so prices are a crucial mechanism in a market economy. Uh, now, if, uh, if the government steps in and decides that this increase in prices is not fair, for instance, uh, and sets the price artificially low, uh, that's going to have a number of effects. And this is straightforward microeconomics 101. Uh, first of all, of course, it will result in shortages as false price signals have been sent by the, to the market. Uh, so people will consume more of the good than there actually is available. Uh, but also, producers will be disincentivized to bring more to market. Uh, so in essence, when a government sets the price of something artificially low, it gives the illusion of abundance in that particular good. And we'll find that similar things happen with interest rates. Uh, so that's, that's what you learn with the demand and supply curves in an economics degree. Uh, but it, also some of the effects are more far reaching when governments set prices. Uh, so it doesn't just result in a shortage um, and then when you stop setting prices, it just shifts all back uh, along, the, uh, along the demand curve. Actually, the, the capital structure of the economy, the underlying capital structure, will mould itself around those false price signals. So in the case of coffee, uh, suppliers will shift over to doing something else. Or they may, for instance, find ways of reducing the quality of coffee that they produce. It may result in any other number of effects that are actually very difficult uh, for economics to predict. Uh, and again, as we'll see in a second, similar things happen with, uh, with interest rates. But one of the key things to understand then is when this has happened, if a government has set the price of something artificially low and it's caused a shortage and has caused these distortions, uh, the worst response it can do then is to double down and set prices even lower, as, for instance, we have seen in Venezuela uh, in recent years. Uh, with calamitous consequences for that particular country. Uh, but th this principle uh, that prices should be set by the market uh, and that free prices are at the core of a market system also goes back thousands of years. Uh, so the Edict of Diocletian in ancient Rome uh, in around 301, the year 301, uh, set prices in ancient Rome and Lactantius who was a philosopher at the time, uh, a proto-economist really, predicted in advance what the consequences would be, that the shortages would get worse um, and, and that there would be these distortions to the capital structure. Uh, and of course, uh, those things did indeed happen and the fixed prices made things far worse in ancient Rome until that edict was rescinded. So then if we think about interest rates and how this relates to other prices in an economy. So in a true free market where interest rates were set by the market, uh, they would be a pricing mechanism that would coordinate a number of different factors in the economy. So first of all, uh, at, the, at the easiest, most surface level, they would coordinate the demand and supply of credit in the economy. So similar to the price of coffee, for instance. So if a lot of people are saving, uh, that, pro that provides a larger pool of savings for the economy, 
which brings down interest rates. Uh, so that allows for more credit growth in an economy. Uh, but additionally, let's say for sake of example, uh, there is an incipient debt bubble that's growing. If people are borrowing a lot relative to the pool of savings, that pushes the interest rate up, uh, which, is, uh, which then uh, dampens down that, that, uh, that credit bubble as it's building up. So interest rates uh, are a natural pricing mechanism, just like the price of coffee or anything else, uh, and that they're constantly re-equilibriating these different factors in the economy. But interest rates then perform another function, uh, which is more important than other prices in the economy, uh, for instance, coffee and so on that we discussed. And that's the time preferences for the economy as a whole. So to take the previous example, if people are saving more, uh, that provides a larger pool of savings, which brings down the interest rate. But that pricing mechanism, that lower interest rate, also signals to the economy that people are deferring consumption to future time periods. Uh, so as people save, that means they're, they're, they're consuming less now, but they're going to be consuming more in future time periods. Uh, now, that pool of savings brings down the interest rate for businesses to be able to borrow at lower rates and invest more for the future. Uh, so just as those investments come to fruition, the consumers in the economy will have more to spend in those future time periods. Uh, so this is a critical aspect of the Austrian school, is understanding that interest rates as a pricing mechanism also coordinate the time preferences for the economy as a whole. Uh, but additionally, of course, interest rates will reflect the underlying risk and other factors in the economy, as we'll come to, as we'll come to see. Uh, so interest rates really are, in many respects, the most important pricing mechanism in the economy. Uh, they, they, uh, they coordinate all of these different functions that we've been discussing. So if you think about what happens then when interest rates are a set rather than uh, being allowed to, to be set by the free market. Again, the effects are similar to when we discussed with government setting the price of coffee, for instance. Uh, at the moment, of course, we live in a system of centrally planned interest rates. Uh, and in essence, this is really the last bastion of price setting by governments. Uh, this, this model has been shown to have failed in every other area, both over the last few decades. Uh, and, of course, over the last couple of millennia, as we saw. So when a central bank sets interest rates artificially low, uh, there are a number of effects. First of all, you end up with uh, too much debt relative to the pool of savings available. So when interest rates are artificially low, people and companies and governments will simply borrow more. But also people will save less. Uh, so this then is similar to the other mechanisms we looked at when uh, the government of, uh, of various countries set the price of food artificially low. Uh, you end up with this mismatch between demand and supply. But you also disturb the intertemporal coordination of the economy. Uh, so, as I mentioned, with interest rates, when people save more, that sends the signal to the economy that brings interest rates down and shows that people are deferring their consumption to future time periods. But when a central bank sets interest rates artificially low, that sends the false price signal to the economy uh, that people are deferring their consumption to future time periods, when in actual fact, they're likely borrowing and spending in this time period, uh, as are corporations uh, and governments as well. But additionally, uh, when interest rates are artificially low, it diverts the resources of the economy to more interest rate sensitive sectors. So the classic example is financial speculation, where if we take hedge funds, for instance, if they are borrowing money at seven or 8% interest rates, they can only leverage up so much. Whereas if they're borrowing money at 0% interest rates, they can leverage up massively. And that makes them artificially profitable. And as we'll see a bit later, they then begin to pull in resources from the rest of the economy as a result of that. So the actual underlying capital structure, the production structure of the economy, becomes distorted, uh, just like with other, when other prices in the economy are set by governments. 
uh, the economy will begin to mould itself around these false price signals. So in that sense, if we think about bubbles, especially uh, a hot topic at the moment, whereas with free market interest rates, uh, people all of a sudden want to borrow a lot of money to fuel a credit bubble that pushes up interest rates. Uh, but when central banks are interest rates artificially low, that actually fuels these credit bubbles. Uh, but additionally, uh, as more and more of the underlying resources of the economy become misallocated, uh, as we'll see in a moment, there's an increase in zombie companies, uh, but also a lot of other metrics to do with looking at the productivity of the economy. Uh, but, and as, as there's more debt, uh, more and more debt created with the artificially low interest rates, we also find that the quality of that debt falls over time. But there's many other subtle factors which we'll go through. But the key idea is just like when a government sets the price of coffee artificially low, it gives the illusion of abundance to the, to the economy, so people consume more and producers produce less. Uh, when interest rates are set artificially low, it gives the illusion of abundance. Uh, so uh, so there will be less savings, but there will be more debt building up. Yeah. So if we think then about just a classic uh, demand curve, this could be any good in the economy, but we can adapt it really for talking about interest rates. And these ideas relate back to uh, Knut Wicksell and the early Austrian school. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the equilibrium interest rate there. Uh, which matches the demand and supply of credit. But if interest rates are set artificially low, uh, that results in that distortion uh, shown at the bottom. Uh, and that shows also the false price signals sent to the economy as a result of this illusion of abundance of savings. So whereas, let's say with coffee, uh, the magnitude of that distortion would, uh, would indicate these shortages, uh, this will actually lead to a lot of other factors in terms of the quality of debt and other things that we'll look at. So before we move on to the data then, uh, very quickly, if we were to test this Austrian school hypothesis against the data over the last generation, this is what we would expect to see. We would want to see uh, that there has been lower and lower savings uh, combined with growing debt. Uh, there would be asset bubbles. Uh, as the newly created credit flows into asset markets. Uh, there'll be malinvestment as resources are diverted towards those sectors that benefit from artificially low interest rates. Uh, fall in quality of debt, of course, uh, and some other factors. And interestingly, one of the things we discuss in, in the book that we wrote last year is some of the differences between uh, the IMF and the Bank for International Settlements in these approaches where several of the chief economists at the BIS over the last few years have cited Hayek and other Austrian school thinkers. Um, and of course, uh, the, the previous chief economist gave us a nice testimonial for the book as well. So specifically then, what we've seen over the last generation is that uh, from, from roughly the 1980s onwards, each recession has been responded to by creating larger and larger debt bubbles. So cent central banks have set lower and lower interest rates, generating larger and larger debt bubbles over the last 40 years or so. So if we take America as an example, when the bubbles burst in the late 1980s in housing and other sectors, the response from Alan Greenspan was to set interest rates at 3%, lowest for generations. Uh, and following that, there were several years of the Greenspan put and that, of course, generated the dot-com bubble, which was a considerably larger bubble than there was during the 80s. When that burst in 2000, the response from the Federal Reserve was even lower interest rates of 1%, which then generated an even larger debt bubble, uh, the housing bubble in that instance. And then, of course, when that burst in 2008, the response was even lower interest rates, the lowest interest rates in history of 0% for years on end and combined with QE. And that has served to create an even larger bubble than that which existed in 2008. So actually around the time of the 2007-08 financial crisis, there was roughly $150 trillion of aggregate global debt. So that's uh, households plus 
corporations plus governments. And after more than a decade of 0% interest rates, that had pretty much doubled to around $300 trillion. Uh, so in essence, uh, far from remedying the situation, uh, the last few years of monetary policy have actually uh, more or less doubled the size of the global debt bubble. So what we see is, is a classic Austrian school bubble, except where it's different to the 1920s, for instance, or the Japanese bubble of the 80s, is that this bubble has built up over the course of an entire generation, uh, where every time the bubble started to burst, central banks have responded by stepping in and setting interest rates even lower and creating an even larger bubble. So we'll start looking at the data on this then. So we can see here that in essence, uh, we have roughly speaking four phases in the growth of this bubble uh, going up to COVID. So we see the falling interest rates of the 80s. Uh, then we go down to the 3% interest rates of the early 90s and the Greenspan put. Uh, then you can see where after that burst in 2000, you have the 1% interest rates. Uh, and then when that bursts, we then have 0% interest rates. So as we look at the data on bond markets, uh, asset bubbles, and so on, what we'd expect to see is that the data, roughly speaking, reflect these four phases of falls in interest rates from the 1980s onwards. But other central banks have followed suit and, and have had a similar pattern. So this is the European Central Bank, uh, which of course started in 2000, uh, but the Bank of England and others have been remarkably similar over the last generation or so in terms of this trend of creating larger and larger debt bubbles. And so if we start off by looking at debt then, which I said is the, the initial classic sign of a bubble induced by artificially low interest rates. Uh, so we see here uh, non-financial corporate debt uh, and indeed uh, from the time interest rates have been falling from the 1980s, we see uh, debt increasing uh, with each phase of the growth of this bubble. Uh, so even after the, uh, uh, after the collapse um, of the beginning of this millennium, you then see uh, with, low, with interest rates set at the floor of 0%, uh, it then sets everything off once again uh, in terms of creating an even larger bubble. But savings as well then, uh, I've seen uh, the type of phenomenon that we would expect in this instance. So as interest rates have come down over the last generation, savings rates have fallen and fallen. Uh, and indeed, we see a, a similar pattern with each of the different waves. So here we can see them together with, uh, with interest rates uh, from the, uh, the Fed funds rate. Uh, so we see there uh, the classic signs, the classic initial signs that we would look for for an Austrian school bubble. So with each of the four phases of the falls in interest rates, you see savings coming down, while at the same time, debt is increasing uh, with each phase of the growth of this bubble. Now, uh, some people talk about the, uh, the debt bubble, quote unquote, as being the core characteristic of an Austrian school bubble. Uh, but this is really the first thing that we'd look at uh, as we'll see in a moment, it, it becomes a lot more complex when we look at some of the effects of this in terms of the quality of debt and what's going on under the surface of the economy in terms of capital structure and so on. And so if we think about asset bubbles then, uh, so we'll look at stock markets and we'll look at housing, but I think in terms of a headline metric for asset bubbles, this is one of my favorites, which is the uh, net worth over GDP. Uh, so if you think about, for instance, housing bubbles, you would look at the value of houses relative to average incomes, and that's a good indicator. Uh, similar to stocks, actually. Uh, obviously, P ratio is widely used, which we'll look at in a minute. But you could look at, for instance, um, at the price of stocks relative to average incomes, uh, effectively the size of the stock market relative to GDP. So here we're just looking at the total assets in the economy relative to average incomes. Uh, and again, you see from the 80s onwards, we see this same pattern that with, with each of the four phases of the growth of this bubble, 
uh, it becomes more and more outlandish uh, in terms of the price of assets relative to incomes. Uh, and you can see there, of course, let's say after the 2008 crisis, you can see this fall in asset prices. Uh, that's the point where the market uh, is saying to us things are overvalued. You know, what we need is a crash in asset prices. Uh, so that really should have continued after 2008, uh, a fall in asset prices. Uh, but of course, that's where central banks stepped in with the lowest interest rates in history. Uh, and you can see they set it off uh, again for the next phase in the growth of the bubble, which we're in the early phases of this bursting at the moment. And there we have the same figure. Uh, so the, the price of assets in the economy relative to GDP, and that's shown uh, with the corresponding patterns in interest rates over the last 40 years. Uh, so again, it's, it's quite clear with everything that we're seeing uh, that this is corroborating the Austrian school theory, that when interest rates are set by central banks rather than the market, it tends to set off all of these different uh, phenomena that we would expect to see. Then if we look at the stock market in particular then, uh, now of course, in any stock market analysis, you would never use a single metric. So we'll look at a few of them today. Um, so first of all, the cyclically adjusted P ratio from Robert Schiller. Uh, now what's particularly interesting here is not just the height of the peaks, which is, you can see are higher than 1929 and historically unprecedented, but also the red line shows you the average P ratios for each decade. So during the growth of this bubble over the last generation, uh, especially from the Greenspan put onwards, uh, the average for every single decade has been higher than any other decade in recorded history going back to the 19th century. Uh, so this, this matches up with what we just saw in terms of the total value of assets uh, being pushed up and up and up with each phase. So then another metric worth considering is the buffer indicator. So this is in essence looking at the size of the stock market relative to GDP. And uh, what's, what's quite interesting here is that if we look at the, uh, the third phase in the bubble, the early 2000s when interest rates were set at 1%, you'll see that the peak there is actually not quite as large as the dot-com bubble of the 1990s, whereas uh, most the other asset bubble metrics we looked at went up with each phase. So the reason for that is uh, in, the, in the first few years of this century, uh, with the 1% interest rates, a lot of the credit created was, of course, flowing into housing. So there was trillions of dollars of new credit created. It was a larger, uh, a larger debt bubble than that of the 1990s. Um, but most of that was flowing uh, into housing. But then, of course, you see once interest rates came down to 0%, uh, we see it taking off again in terms of the, the size of the stock market relative to the economy. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, looking back in previous decades, it's, uh, it's quite unprecedented. So another metric worth considering then on stock markets is Tobin's Q. And again, uh, rather than just looking at the peaks and the troughs here, it's worth considering the averages for each decade. So during the growth of this bubble over the last generation, again, we see that the average for every decade during this period has been higher than any preceding decade. But of course, when we look at stock market valuations, uh, if the P ratio and so on is becoming high, an argument may well be, well, there's going to be substantial increases in productivity, for instance, uh, and there may be resources shifting from the rest of the economy to invest, it in, the, to invest in the stock market. Uh, so what we would look at in the Austrian school then is to combine this with how much of those inflated uh, stock prices are being fueled by credit creation. And so here we have margin debt as well uh, over this period. 
And indeed, what we can see is with each of these four phases that I've been discussing, margin debt has increased uh, more and more, so fueling more and more of the, uh, stock, of the stock bubbles that we've been looking at. Now, this is just in absolute terms in billions of dollars, but it's worth also considering the amount of margin debt relative to the size of the stock market. So that's what we have here. Uh, and we, have, we can, of course, see it, uh, see it increasing uh, during the last generation. But it's worth noting that this, then, this metric of margin debt is relative to market cap. Uh, and market cap, of course, as we've just seen with the buffer indicator, has also been increasing massively uh, during this entire generation of larger and larger bubbles. Um, so this, in some ways, uh, doesn't, quite, uh, doesn't quite capture it enough how much this margin debt has been increasing, so how much of the stock market has been fueled by artificially cheap credit. So reflecting on this, um, what we did for the book last year, we were looking at different metrics for stock market bubbles and thinking through, is there an Austrian school indicator that we could come up with for stock market bubbles? Uh, so, in essence, what we looked at was the Buffett indicator, uh, which Warren Buffett had said is the most reliable indicator of stock market bubbles, and also the, uh, the amount of uh, margin debt relative to market cap. So, in essence, what this is looking at, we created a composite index here of those two factors, both weighted equally. So, what this shows is the size of the stock market relative to the economy and also how much of the stock market is being fueled by credit. So it takes those two factors, uh, puts them into one index. So this should capture what we're looking for as, let's say, an Austrian school indicator of, uh, of stock market bubbles fueled by artificially low interest rates. And of course, what you can see here is, again, as interest rates have come down over the last generation, with each iteration of this, uh, this particular composite index has been going up and up and up. Uh, so not only is, is this a classic stock market bubble, uh, but increasingly more and more it's being fueled by artificially cheap credit. Of course, this is, this is a classic thing that we would expect to see and that the Austrian school would predict. Uh, had you asked an Austrian school economist 20 years ago what would happen if interest rates were set at 1% and then at 0% for years on end? Of course, from 2009 onwards, it has not just been 0% interest rates, though. We've also had quantitative easing. Uh, and this is interesting. So this is looking at the Federal Reserve balance sheet and the NASDAQ. Uh, and in essence, how much of the valuation in the NASDAQ was fueled by the Fed balance sheet. And the correlation between these two was actually around 98% during this period, during the period of QE. So from 2009 to 2016, the correlation between the Fed balance sheet and the NASDAQ was, it was around 98%. So if you think about stock market analysis, uh, people may well be looking at the underlying fundamentals, which companies are gonna be innovative, what's happening with global trade, all of these other factors. But in essence, during this period, all you really needed to know was uh, what are central banks gonna be doing? how much QE is going to be pumped into the market, because that accounted for the vast majority of what happened with the NASDAQ and other stock markets during this period. And here we have uh, house prices then in the UK. And of course, what we see is the same pattern with each phase in the growth of the bubble. But house prices are are interesting in particular because uh, this, this is le leading to a lot, of, a lot of societal problems in the UK and in other countries that young people can't afford to buy houses. So whereas with stock market bubbles, the average 30-year-old uh, does not own hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars or euros of, of stocks, um, most young people want to own a house. And for most people, it will be the, the most valuable asset they ever own. So when you look at this, uh, again, 
uh, you can see again after 2008 that that's the market telling us that this asset bubble needed to burst, that prices need to return back to normality. But with the response of 0% interest rates, you see house prices just taking off yet again. And of course, in many developed countries, houses are really out of reach for the vast majority of young people now, which is, which is very unusual historically, actually. Uh, and this is resulting in other factors, for instance, uh, in, in who they vote for. So people often change their voting pattern once they own their own house. Once people own their own house, they tend to vote for lower taxes uh, and less intervention, for instance. Uh, it tends to be uh, owning your own house and having a family uh, is when things change. So in Britain, we see increasingly uh, the millennial generation, which are not that young now. It's the oldest are in their early 40s. And um, so I'm, the, I'm part of the oldest of the millennials. And uh, again, I know many friends from 35 years old onwards, let's say, who, who don't own their own house and really want to, and they're going to vote accordingly. Uh, they're not going to change their voting patterns as previous generations did. And this one's for the US. So a similar, a similar concept when it comes to uh, loans, credit flowing into property. What we see here is commercial and industrial loans, which we might think of as a proxy for uh, productive investment, productive credit creation, let's say. Uh, so this is going to factories and entrepreneurs versus real estate loans, which we could look at as a proxy for asset speculation for regular people. Uh, and of course, you see uh, with each phase, the divergence grows and grows. And actually, you can also see in previous generations most of the time, actually, productive loans were higher than real estate loans. So again, not only is this quite unprecedented, this growth in uh, real estate loans, uh, a fairly mainstream speculative asset for most people, but actually when you look at the size of that divergence over time, with each phase of the growth of this bubble, it really is quite extraordinary. So that was asset bubbles. But when we think of the Austrian school and what it would predict uh, in terms of an Austrian school bubble, it actually goes well beyond just the price of assets. Uh, so we'll look at bonds now, which are a critical area of, of Austrian school analysis. Uh, so this comes from the OECD, and they're looking at the quality of bonds. And this is for around, um, I believe, uh, it's for, for several dozen different countries. It's not just the US. Uh, so if you remember the early graphs that we looked at with the, with the growth of debt going up with each phase, uh, this in essence is like a, a mirror reflection of that. So with each phase of the growth of the bubble over the last 40 years, uh, whereas we've seen debt grow with each phase, we see the quality of bonds fall with each phase of the growth of this bubble. Now this, this is going to be a critically important area over the next two or three years. Uh, so last year in Britain, we had, uh, we very nearly had a significant blow up in the pension sector as a result of so-called liability driven investments or LDIs. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg of what's happened in bond portfolios, uh, especially over the last decade or so. But as you can see, this has been happening actually over the last generation. Uh, that as, as interest rates have fallen uh, and the debt bubbles have grown, the quality of debt has fallen with each phase. Uh, so what we'll see increasingly is more and more defaults on bonds uh, in these bond portfolios. Uh, and that means people's pension funds, uh, all of these other sectors, people who have, in many cases, saved for their whole lives. Uh, and, and that... Uh, those savings have been invested in bond portfolios, which are now incredibly poor quality debt. But of course, what the Austrian school will predict is that during the 0% interest rates, uh, those low quality bonds will be sustained. They can keep going. So it's when you raise interest rates that it then bursts those bubbles and you end up with a default. So think of subprime mortgages. Those were generated during the period of 1% interest rates. And it was only when interest rates went up that all of those defaults started. 
What we'll see now is a similar phenomenon, but not just with mortgages, securitized mortgages, but a lot of other sectors, a lot of other types of bonds, which are, which are very low quality. Uh, and there we have, this, so this again is uh, from the OECD. So I've taken that fall in the quality of bonds over the last generation, and you can see it there with the uh, federal funds rate, that is the, the American interest rate, uh, quite clearly seeing that the falls in interest rates uh, during this period have preceded this fall in the quality of bonds. Uh, and again, that's pretty much uh, a fairly precise uh, mirror of what was happening with the increases in debt and the falls in savings during this period as well. This figure as well uh, is from the book that we wrote. Uh, what we're looking at here then, we can see in green the American interest rate, and you can really see it more graphically here. So this is digging down into bond portfolios now, and you see here the blue line is BBB. So BBB is the lowest quality of debt that is allowed in uh, an investment grade portfolio, for instance, a pension fund. So it's, it's low quality, relatively high risk debt uh, that will be in, in pension funds, for instance. So you can see going back several decades, typically, it will be a small proportion of most bond portfolios. But you can see here with each phase of the fall in interest rates, uh, as central banks have generated larger and larger bubbles, this has also impacted the quality of debt in investment grade bond portfolios. And you can actually see towards the end here that BBB debt actually uh, it began, it was more outsized than every other stratum put together. Uh, so AAA, AA and A. So it's quite extraordinary. Roughly speaking, half of all of the, of, uh, half of all of the bonds in investment grade portfolios are actually the lowest possible quality that's permitted. Um, and there's a phenomenon some of you may be aware of called fallen angels which is the idea that BBBs, uh, once you end up with debt defaults, uh, once you get into uh, a chain reaction, a lot of those BBBs are going to be downgraded. Now, in previous generations, uh, that wasn't such, wasn't such a bad thing because it would be a relatively small percentage, maybe 10% or so on, of bond portfolios that were made up of BBB. So even if a quarter of them were downgraded, that, that wasn't such a problem. But when we have this stage that we're at now, where BBBs are more than half of, uh, of investment grade bond portfolios, you can see how this is going to impact things once these low quality bonds start defaulting over the next year to two years. So really this, this blow up that we saw last year in Britain with LDIs is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's been happening in bond portfolios around the world uh, over the last few years. And here we see, just reflecting that, the, the probability of downgrades, uh, which again has is, is been far lower during this period for the BBBs. So you can see the prevalence uh, building up uh, over time between 1992 and 2019. Uh, you can see it bulging in the middle there. So more and more bond portfolios has been constituted by, by these types of bonds. And the same thing has happened with covenants. So this also comes from the OECD. And we see during this period that the quality of covenants, covenants are the protections that you have uh, for your bonds. So for instance, if a company starts defaulting, uh, a protection might be that it's not allowed to pay out bonuses to its directors, something like that. Uh, so covenants are important in terms of protecting these bond holders who, of course, now have very low quality debt in their pension funds and in their bond portfolios. Uh, but so this, this makes, also makes things considerably worse, that they have far fewer protections now than they would have done in previous generations. So lower quality debt with fewer protections. And so... Th this, uh, this brings me to an interesting phenomenon then, which is worth considering. Um, Richard Cantillon was a French economist 
in the 18th century, and he wrote about what has come to be known as the Kantian effect. So what that says is that when new money is created, uh, the people who receive that newly created money benefit disproportionately. So in the days of Kantian, it was the French royal court. So when new money was created, those around the king would receive that new money and they could then spend it into the economy or invest it in assets. And as that money circulated, prices would go up and asset values would go up. And of course, the people who received that newly created money last, uh, which in those days would have been the peasants, uh, had to suffer those increased prices uh, and asset values. But of course, similar, similar phenomena take place in this day and age, but rather than being those around the French royal court, it tends to be large corporations and hedge funds and other financial institutions that benefit disproportionately from this newly created money. And one of the phenomena uh, which is going to have long-lasting effects is uh, the extent to which the human capital structure has been distorted by this. So if we think of hedge funds such as uh, financial institutions such as hedge funds, again, if they're on the receiving end of this newly created credit, if they're able to leverage up massively, then they will begin to pull in resources from the rest of the economy, resources that would have been used elsewhere. So in the UK, this has especially happened with graduates in, uh, in mathematics, in engineering, in physics and so on, who increasingly, during the phases of the growth of this bubble, have gone to work in the financial sector rather than actually inventing things in the economy. So the UK Commission for Employment and Skills noted some time back that many of the best mathematicians were being poached, as they put it, by the financial industry. And these are all formal reviews uh, commissioned by the government that I've, that I've used here. And this, this is gone into in greater detail in the book that we wrote last year. But the Roberts Review uh, in 2002 found that a quarter of mathematics graduates were going to work in finance. Then a few years later, 2006, which you, you may remember was pretty much the peak of that phase of the asset bubble, found that this had increased to 43%. And then in 2009, the Department for Innovation, Universities and Skills found that only 25% of mathematics graduates were actually going to work in science. So it's a classic Kantian effect, actually, of the recipients of this newly created money, in this case, hedge funds and other financial institutions that can leverage up massively, often 40 to 1, will begin to pull in resources from the rest of the economy that would have been used productively elsewhere in the economy. And so here, this reflects that then. We see, uh, as interest rates are held artificially low, you see active issuers becoming far more dominant in bond markets there. So this is in the US. And we see a similar thing in Europe uh, again. So the percentage of bond issuances that came from large established companies uh, went up with each phase of the falling interest rates. Now, I mentioned when it came to stock market bubbles, we looked at what might be used as an Austrian school metric for stock market bubbles. And what we settled on was creating a composite index of the Buffett indicator uh, in other words, the size of the stock market relative to the economy, combined with how much of the stock market is being fueled by credit. But we wanted to come up with something similar for bond markets as well. And I came across some interesting work by two economists in the US, two professors at Harvard, Greenwood and Hansen, who looked at the percentage of uh, bonds worldwide that are speculative grade. So that's what you see in blue here. Uh, so they're non-investment grade bonds. Uh, and in red, you see the default rate. So it actually has a very powerful predictive capacity, just looking at the percentage of bonds issued that are speculative grade. 
uh, but as you can see, it doesn't, it doesn't increase over time. So it's actually not reflecting some of the other phenomena that we've looked at today, where with each phase of the bubble, it's gone up and up and up. Uh, so what we did, uh, we used this key concept from Greenwood and Hansen, and we created a new metric, which we called the bond risk ratio. And in essence, uh, there are a few things, a couple of things that we did here. First of all, rather than using just plain percentages, just the percentage of bonds that are speculative grade, we turned it into a ratio so that the, it would be more similar to P ratios and so on, but for bonds. Um, so in essence, what we're looking at is uh, the amount of speculative grade bonds divided by investment grade bonds, which gives us a good ratio. But additionally, what we did is we took BBB, which as you remember is the lowest quality debt in investment grade portfolios, and we put that in the numerator alongside speculative, because those are the fallen angels. So those are in many ways the riskiest part of the entire bond market, so those BBBs that are in the investment grade portfolios. Uh, so in essence, what you're seeing here is the ratio between risky debt and investment grade quality debt. And you see with each phase of the growth of the bubble that the bond risk ratio is going up and up. That is, uh, the, ratio, uh, the ratio is indicating a huge shift towards far more risky debt during this period. Uh, and you can actually see here as well that it's, it's quite a good indicator um, for what's to come. So if you think about uh, the bursting of the, of the uh, housing bubble, for instance, uh, you see the bond risk ratio actually peaks and starts falling a little bit before the bursting of that bubble. So it's quite a nice indicator to look at in terms of what's to come uh, using this ratio between speculative debt and investment grade debt. Uh, but of course, we see here again, it, with the period of 0% interest rates, uh, it just goes up to, to something historically unprecedented. And that reflects that previous graph that we looked at, where more and more of investment grade bond portfolios are being stuffed with the lowest quality debt. So that was bond, the bond markets then. So then we'll look at metrics for the amount of malinvestment in the economy. That is the, the fall in productivity during this time period. So here we can see with each phase of monetary policy uh, that the delinquency rates for companies have fallen with each recession. So of course, some economists might look at this and say, well, that means that central banks have done a brilliant job. That's a success for monetary policy. What we're looking at here is that companies are being preserved during recessions. Uh, companies are not going bust increasingly during recessions during this period. Uh, so perhaps for that, central bankers should get a pat on the back. But if we then dig a little bit deeper and look at what's going on, we have some data from the Bank for International Settlements on zombie companies. And what we see again, uh, reflecting that, almost like a mirror reflection, is the rise in zombie companies during this period with the falling interest rates. Uh, and again, you see this classic pattern that we've been looking at today. And there are some countries, for instance, from memory in Italy, uh, it was more than a fifth of all public companies uh, are zombie companies. So you think about how this is built up over time with the, with the lower and lower interest rates. So when they finally are forced to raise interest rates, it's a lot of zombie companies that are going to be, that are going, to be going under. Uh, in essence, they've just been fueled by this artificially cheap credit, uh, not just for the last three years or four years or during COVID, but again, the phenomenon has been taking place over the last generation, uh, whereby each recession has been responded to uh, by, by setting even lower interest rates. And from that particular paper then, from the BIS, they note here, they, they find the empirical link between interest rates and the growth in zombie companies. 
uh, and they say at the end, our, our study cannot answer this question. Uh, we leave the exploration of this trade-off to future research. So, of course, the Austrian school has a deep understanding of this, going back to the 19th century. What we're seeing here is the interest rates set by central banks rather than set by the market are setting false price signals to the economy, which is causing more and more distortions. And one of the, uh, one of the effects of that, and one of the indicators, is zombie companies. Uh, but it, the, the, the effects also go much deeper than just zombie companies. And now again, you see it over time. So the BIS kindly sent me the data that they used for this. And that is the BIS data for 14 uh, different economies. They're all developed economies. And again, we see the classic pattern that we're looking for today uh, in all of these different indicators that we would expect. But additional to zombie companies, in writing this book, again, we wanted to come up with some original metrics that we could look at that would be suitable for Austrian school analysis. So we looked at the stock market metric, which looks at the size of the stock market relative to the economy and how much of it is being fueled by credit. Then we looked at a bond market metric, which looks at speculative debt divided by investment grade high quality debt. Uh, so we saw that was also a valuable, valuable indicator. But we wanted to create something similar for productivity in the economy. In particular, with all of this credit creation, how much of this credit is actually being used productively? So we began by creating a metric we called the economic performance index. So what that does is it combines the asset turnover ratio with the return on assets and the return on equity, and it puts those together into one composite index with them weighted equally. Uh, so you can see this falling over time, uh, over the last few years. So that, re that reflects falling productivity, essentially. Uh, but again, we want to look at this relative to the amount of debt that has been created during this period. So here we have the economic performance index, and the amount of liabilities that are on corporate balance sheets during this period. So with all of this credit creation that's happened, you know, a valid criticism of the Austrian school might be, well, what if, what if this credit is being used productively? Is it leading to lots of new inventions? Are we going to be moving into a land of plenty? But this indicates that that's in fact not the case. So the more credit that has been created, uh, actually the economic performance index has gone down with each phase. Uh, so credit is actually resulting in less and less productivity. One of the metrics that's been used by some other economists to look at the productivity of debt is using GDP. So they look at, for instance, with each new unit of debt being created, each new billion dollars of debt being created, or whatever it might be, how much does that contribute to growing GDP? So that's also been falling over time. But that is quite a simplistic metric. The reason being, if corporations are borrowing money and using it unproductively, just paying for nice TVs and sports cars for the directors and so on, that would still show up in GDP statistics. Um, so money that's squandered does in fact still increase GDP, at least in the short term. Whereas what we see here, if, if, uh, if a company borrows money and pays for sports cars for its directors, that's not going to increase the economic performance index. Um, so this is, this is, we would argue, a more valid metric for the marginal productivity of debt. So what we did then is, is combine those. So we're looking at the economic performance index over liabilities. So it's the previous sheet that we looked at uh, combined into one. So what we're really looking at here is one metric which says for each unit of debt that gets created, is that actually contributing to increasing economic performance or is it neutral? Or is it the opposite? Is it contributing to falling economic performance? So I think you have the, the answer here. That for every, every new unit of debt that's been created, going back nearly 20 years, that has in fact 
been resulting in falling, uh, falling economic performance during this period. But then we might ask, what, what has been causing this? Of course, we've looked at interest rates, but one of the other things that we touched on earlier with, was quantitative easing. And we looked at that relative to stock markets, but not relative to productivity. Now, of course, the classic example for QE is that it boosts the economy. Uh, you're supplying plentiful credit, uh, companies will borrow, they'll invest for the future, we can get the economy going again. So if we look at whether that is in fact the case, this is the balance sheet for the European Central Bank, which was the largest purchaser of corporate bonds during this time period. And of course, you see a pretty classic initial indicator there, that as the European Central Bank bought more and more corporate bonds, in other words, uh, they more and more were, were incentivizing credit creation in the system, we see the marginal productivity of debt going down with each new phase of QE. So far from stimulating the economy, what we see is QE from the European Central Bank has actually stimulated falls in productivity. And of course, this would also be reflected in zombie companies and so on. Uh, but this, I think, is is a more sophisticated metric than just looking at the marginal productivity of debt when it comes to GDP, for instance, or even zombie companies. So we're digging down into whether this debt is being used productively by companies. And I think here we have a pretty conclusive answer to that question. So as a summary then, as to what we've seen, this, this bubble that we're in now Many people talk about uh, the amount of money that was created during COVID or perhaps during the epoch of 0% interest rates and QE. In actual fact, this bubble that we're in has been building over the last 40 years or so, where each recession has been responded to through much of the developed world by lower and lower interest rates, creating larger and larger debt bubbles. But this also has not just manifested itself in asset bubbles, but as we've seen in the quality of bond portfolios, in uh, chronic low productivity, and all of the other things that we've been looking at. And of course, some of these phenomena have social, sociological effects, like housing prices in particular, when young people cannot buy houses. And, and of course, the key Austrian school way of understanding this is to think about interest rates as a pricing mechanism. Uh, interest rates are a pricing mechanism not dissimilar to other prices of coffee or fuel or whatever else. Uh, interest rates should be set by the market like other prices, not by central planners. But when we do have central planners setting interest rates, the consequences are what we've seen today. That is, it sends false price signals to the economy, which causes distortions throughout the economy, not just in terms of the quantity of debt, uh, not just in terms of stock market bubbles, but as we've seen, it goes right, right through the economy, right into the productivity of individual companies, uh, into individual bond portfolios and pension funds, and so on. And in my view, we are now in the largest bubble in history uh, across all of these asset classes that we've looked at. I know some of them burst last year. I started giving this talk um, early last year, actually, at, at uh, the University of Bath. And uh, so, so some of these asset classes have began their, their process of bursting, but many of the others, like housing, have not really started yet. Uh, and that's what we'll be going through soon. Uh, but I suspect what will happen is, what will, over the next couple of years, we'll see that very low quality debt, which remember is now even worse quality than the subprime fiasco, uh, remember, the bond risk ratio indicates far higher risk in the system than, uh, than that particular bubble. So as the defaults start and really get going, my view is inflation will actually come down. Uh, you're, you're, you're in danger of more of a debt deflation scenario. Uh, and I think once it becomes acute, and I suspect it will take a lot of central bankers and policymakers by surprise because they don't understand what we've been talking about today, I suspect what will happen is there will be an attempt at least to have another iteration of this. So interest rates will come down to 0%, uh, 
potentially even negative interest rates uh, in many countries in an attempt to try and uh, uh, create another phase of this. Um, and we'll have to see whether they're successful with that. I suspect it would require negative interest rates rather than just 0% interest rates. But of course, what we'll see is all of the things that we've been looking at will be even worse. So the quality of bonds in people's pension funds, all of these things will be made even worse if central banks then try and implement another fifth phase of this. Um, but we'll have to wait and see whether they do, in fact, uh, embark on that particular course. But rather than just pessimism then, what can be done? Uh, and here we have a picture of Ludwig Erhard, um, who many would say is the father of the German economic miracle. And at the end of World War II, what Erhard did was against the orders of the Allied generals uh, and the Allied administration uh, who wanted price fixing across the German economy. What Erhard did was very quickly ordered that prices should be set by the market. And actually, remarkably quickly, within a period of weeks, uh, people were able to buy products that they had not seen for years uh, because the market began solving the problems through its natural pricing mechanisms. And actually, in Britain, we continued with, um, with price setting and rationing actually well into the 1950s. Uh, and that really hobbled a lot of Britain's economic growth for the next generation. And so this, uh, again, this particular example, I think we have to learn from this with respect to interest rates. Uh, when we start to think of interest rates as a pricing mechanism, uh, we can start to consider what, what Ludwig Erhard did and what's been done in other previous times in history, for instance, during the time of Emperor Diocletian, where the only solution to those problems was to allow prices to be set by the market. Uh, and so an Austrian school response to what's been happening in previous years, and what unfortunately I think is going to become even worse in coming years, uh, perhaps quite soon, the response will be to move to a system where interest rates, like other prices, uh, are set by the market. So that the quantity of, the quantity of savings and the demand for debt can, can re-equilibrate, and we'll see all of those other factors that we've been looking at, uh, bond portfolios can get back to normal, uh, and so on. And so to conclude, I think the Austrian school allows us to understand current developments more than other schools of economics. It really, uh, if you think about how simplistic a lot of academic economics is, with respect to the consequences of setting interest rates. It's treated in essence like, uh, almost like a thermodynamic system. You pull this lever uh, and GDP goes up, unemployment goes down, and that's that. In actual fact, interest rates have a highly complex relationship with the rest of the economy, as we've seen. Uh, so just like other pricing mechanisms in the economy, it really is crucial that they are, that they are set by the market. Uh, as we've seen, this, this bubble is not just a 10-year or 15-year bubble, but it's been growing over 40 years. Uh, and one way or another, one of the crucial things to look at then in coming years will be how to move to this system where interest rates can be set by the market. Uh, Ludwig Erhard, of course, did things very quickly at the end of World War II. Um, but perhaps it may take uh, some years to move to this, but I think this is going to be the critical challenge for our time in terms of monetary economics. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Max, uh, for uh, the overview of Austrian economics with regards to all various kinds of uh, markets on the, in the financial system and uh, explaining what is going on or has been going on and the question of whether this is just... Uh, the, or actually, the question remains, how can we fix the problems with interest rates? Mm -hmm. 
uh, last week at a big conference that we that the central bank hosted um, we had philip lane from uh, the ecb here and uh, he was approached by several of the audience uh, and uh, members of the ha of the board here asking what will happen with interest rates uh, there was no clear answer um, so this is actually something that we should look into and this is the question what is the Austrian school approach mm -hmm. and what can we do on that front and I would just simply open the floor now because there is a lot to say on each and every slide I, am, I assume and there are many people who probably view this critical and say you know Austrian economics is just too one-sided approach um, maybe I'll open it to the audience and uh, ask for ask you to criticize, question, or add, mm -hmm. or uh, please go ahead. For um, so we... uh, thank you again. Uh, if we look at the mismatch in interest rates and in uh, sort of what the market might have done, and also uh, what you've shown in the last 40 years happening, um, how come would you say we don't see the same? A drastic uh, price level increases over the last 40 years that we might see if it was so mismatched. Um, eight, you know, 8% inflation is high, but historically not as high as it could be. So, okay, so with inflation in particular, uh, a lot of people see inflation as the primary negative consequence of easy monetary policy. But that's really just the beginning. And in fact, Easy monetary policy can actually be deflationary. Uh, so it's only really in the last couple of years that inflation has taken off. And like I said, I think it'll actually come down. Uh, if we look at the previous decade of 0% and negative interest rates in Europe, for instance, most of the time the inflation rate for the euro was below the 2% target. So the ECB was actually trying to generate more inflation through QE. There's a really good economist called Acharya, who was, I think, deputy governor of the Indian Central Bank, and I believe is now a lecturer at one of the universities in America. And he looked at the empirical link between QE, a bit like we did with the um, ECB balance sheet and productivity. He looked at that with regard to um, zombie companies and also inflation. In essence, with each round of QE in Europe, it actually reduced inflation, again, down to almost zero. Uh, and in his view, all of the extra money was essentially being sunk into zombie companies and unproductive companies. So that ties in with what we were looking at here. Um, so really, there is this view of looking at inflation as the primary indicator of excess money creation. So, so, so to me, that's not Austrian school thinking. In fact, another classic example might be the 1920s. During the 1920s, a lot of new money was created as a result of, again, artificially low interest rates. But there was no inflation. And so Irving Fisher and others looked at that uh, and said, well, the price level is stable. Therefore, uh, the economy will be stable. And many central bankers said similar things in the last 20 years. But Friedrich von Hayek in the 1920s looked at that and said, well, there's a lot of new money being created, especially in the US and it's not leading to rising prices in the shops. So therefore, where is it all going? And of course, it was going into asset bubbles and so on, a lot of these other sectors. So yeah, so what I would say is um, we, need a, we need a significant shift away from just looking at inflation as the main indicator of these problems. It's, uh, it's very much just a surface indicator, and it can even do more harm than good, because you could be focusing on um, price levels when, in fact, um, you, have, you can have trillions of dollars or euros of new credit being created, which is flowing into asset bubbles all over the place. It's, it's creating zombie companies, but it, but it may not increase inflation at all. Next question. Bitte. Thank you. And nobody uh, would ask about the aggregation of data because that's correct, no question. And it's a question of interpretation. Uh, what is the indicator of inflation, or is it more deflation uh, on the horizon? Maybe a Japan style stagnation, deflation, but a very precise question on a segment which we are expert to. 
You pointed out that your think tank was leading in the question of AI and AI implementation. For us in Europe, at least, at least say the rest of Europe, the continent, we are looking at UK, that UK gets in the last year, the last years, uh, I think more foreign direct, direct invest, investments on AI technologies than France and Germany together. Uh, okay, that's a spe special technology, but it's a big part of the technological sector. Maybe you can add some inside view from this uh, per perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so, so obviously what we're, what we're looking at with a lot of these figures today is it's quite pessimistic in terms of what might happen from here. Um, so I like to think, uh, but I do like to be optimistic. So we have to look at what else might get us out of this trap of low productivity, increasing debt and so on. And that's why I really like AI a lot. Um, so I, I find it fascinating for a long time. I did my master's actually at the London School of Economics using AI to look at stock market bubbles and other, uh, other asset bubbles and so on. Um, and yeah, I think if you look at chat GPT uh, and other, other types of um, AI that's developing at the moment, uh, chat GPT is really uh, just, just one thing happening. I think it has the potential to radically increase productivity. Um, but it's worth noting it hasn't, it hasn't fed through to productivity statistics so far. So if, we look, if you think about Robert Solo, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, he initiated a lot of growth economics. Um, uh, and there's been, he won the Nobel Prize. And there's been several other Nobel Prize winners since then looking at growth economics. He came to the conclusion that something like 87.5% of growth in GDP over time comes from technology, uh, call it 90%. Uh, but he also looked at the productivity statistics from the computer revolution onwards, from the, from, as, as computers began to be used more and more from the 1970s. He found that it didn't really feed into productivity statistics. He said the computer revolution could be seen everywhere other than productivity statistics. And of course, that's continued really. I mean, we all use computers, all, most of us all day, with whatever we're doing for work. Um, yet realistically, if you look at productivity, again, it's been often stagnant, or in some cases even falling. Uh, so the question is, will this new phase of AI change that? Um, so I, I gave a speech, uh, again, we, we ran a couple of events in the European Parliament on artificial intelligence, um, some roundtable discussions and another event. Um, one of those, the speech I gave was on, was looking at DARPA, actually, which is the part of the US military which engages in very far out speculative projects. They, in fact, more or less invented the internet, GPS, a lot of other things. And of course, they've done lots of work on AI. And there's a particular thinker at DARPA that became interested in predicting developments in AI, not just over one or two years, but over 10, 20, 30 years, because this is obviously very important to DARPA. And, and he, looked, he said that there would likely be three waves of AI. The first wave was handcrafted AI. So if you think about something ch playing chess, for instance, handcrafted AI, the uh, developers program in all of the different openings and all of the different moves. So that was what you had, let's say, during the 80s. Then you move into machine learning, which is what we've had over the last few years, where the, the AI playing chess learns to play chess itself requires little to no input. Um, but then there's a third phase, which he calls contextual adaptation, where in essence it understands more the context of what it's doing, so it can formulate new theories. And I think that third wave of AI is what will likely lead to radical productivity increases. Because at that point, you could think about even scientific development. Think about all of the physicists and so on working working at the moment on new theories in physics, but in actual fact, you could just have AI, which would just absorb all of this information and proceed to produce new theories in physics. It's very difficult to say how far we are away from that, but you know, it could be a decade or so. I mean, it surprised a lot of people what's happened in the last couple of years or so. 
so yes, I think it does have, have the potential. I know just the more direct part of your question as to why the UK leads as well. I, I think we do have, um, it goes back quite a long time to, to Alan Turing. I think there's been a significant interest in this area, going back even to the 19th century with Babbage, where effectively com invented computers, not far from me actually in Devon, uh, about 20 minutes from where I live, uh, he worked. So yeah, I think there's that factor as well, is that it goes, goes back a long way in the UK. But will this rise of productivity that eventually will happen, maybe in 10 years, as you said, help us, uh, uh, will avoid the burst of the bubble that we see? Again, to me, I think asset values have to come down. So when we think of how can we avoid the bursting of the bubble, that in many ways is what's caused this problem. We need asset prices to come down. We need stock market metrics to normalize. We, need, we of course need house prices to come down. Now of course it's not going to be much fun for people who own their own houses and who have a massive mortgage on their house if house prices come down by even 50%, let's say, which is maybe what we've, what's required to come down to normal levels. Um, so I think the key aspect may well be the productivity aspect of this. Um, so yes, if AI is implemented in a lot of companies, again, like the, the economic performance index and the things that we looked at, I think can go up. But again, it's, it's, it's become so chronic at this point with large companies just issuing 0% or even negative interest rate bonds that it's, it's going to be painful, I think, anyway. Yeah. Two questions, three questions, four questions. One, two, three, four. Thank you so much. So, and keep the question short. So yeah, I'll um, keep it very short. Yeah. Yeah, so my name is Aditya and I'll quickly come back to the question. So one of the main criticism about the Austrian school is it's seen as very unethical. Like when you ask for a solution, they're like, we want to root the money out. For example, you said the three main causes of you know, the crisis is housing bubble, commodity bubble, whatever. So one of the solutions is just flush out the excess money. But you know for a fact that I think everyone can agree that the flushing out process is very painful. For a lot of people, and it can bring down the entire economy. So, what would the solution be for an Austrian economist? Like, how can we flush the drain the system in a way without causing immense pain? Because Keynes comes and say, "Look, in the long run, we are all dead. So, let's look for the short-term solution that is excess spending, like government deficit, just boost up spending, we can get out of the crisis." And Austrians are like, "Let's wait. Let's just get this over with." But you know, you get, you get the point. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the question. Okay, so. So first part, uh, again, what we're talking about is a pricing mechanism in the economy, right? So the same argument is made with other forms of price fixing. If you go to Venezuela, the, um, the government there under Chavez decided that it would be fair to set the price of food artificially low so that poor people would have access to more food, okay? And uh, of course, anyone who criticized this was derided, you don't have compassion for the poor. This actually, to a certain extent, these arguments have been used elsewhere, for instance, in Britain in the 1970s. Um, you know, if, you're not, if the government doesn't set prices artificially low, it's because you don't care about the poor and so on. But of course, we see what happened in Venezuela. People are starving, people are having to resort to eating their pets. We saw what happened in Britain in the 1970s. You know, when, when the government sets the price of things artificially low, it does not help, help the poor, it just results in shortages. And in fact, we'd be better off with free market prices, which has in essence, over the last generation, created inc an incredible land of plenty for the whole population. I mean, anybody can go into a supermarket and it's just incredible what we have when you think about it in historical terms. I mean, the poorest people have access to mangoes and kiwi fruits and things that kings didn't have access to, at least very easily, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, so that's the first point, is that I do not think it's compassionate for the government to set prices of things artificially low, despite the fact that that argument has been used um, many times. And then secondly, it's also worth noting, um, I wouldn't necessarily pull credit out of the system, just stop putting more in and just let it float around and I think things would equilibrate over time. But if, again, if we think about this has been going on for a generation now, okay? So if you think about when the dot-com bubble burst, if they had just let that happen and not done the 1% interest rates of 2003 and four, it would have been kind of painful. House prices would have fallen quite a lot. Of course, the, the NASDAQ would have remained low for longer. Stock markets would have remained lower, but it would have cleared out the system. 
and we would not have had the 2008 bubble. We would not have had all of those people having their houses seized from them, which is even worse. Uh, and again, had we let things clear after the 2008 bubble, it would have been more painful in 2000, but we still would not be in the position of what we're about to go through, where people's entire pension funds are going to evaporate because they've been stuffed with all of this very low quality debt. So, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's compassionate. I think, um, I think allowing prices to be set by the market creates, creates incredible prosperity for everybody, including the poorest people in society. Andreas Breitenfellner. Um, yeah, I, I, I can follow, I think, most part of your, of your diagnosis, and indeed, it's very worrying. Um, I have a trouble to, to follow the, the causal link between, between the, all these figures you've, you've shown to us on the one hand on, and on the other hand the, uh, the, the cause of, of, of uh, cheap money, so to say, uh, done by, by, uh, produced by central banks. Uh, I mean, this correlation, as you, as you know, I mean, it's apparent, of course, but correlation doesn't mean uh, a causal link. And uh, I wonder whether you could provide more of, of, uh, of uh, type of substance co to convince me yeah, of, of this causal link. And, and then if, and perhaps there are also details to say, I mean, for example, on the ECB figure you have shown, uh, there one should, of course, know that uh, only a very small part of, of this ECB balance sheet is uh, corporate bonds. The, the huge part, of course, is sovereign bonds, yeah? But anyway, this is a, a detail. Uh, yeah, anyway, but, but it's, um, uh, it, so you produced a very, very direct link from this to, to corporate uh, profitability, and that's a, a bit of uh, vague, of course. But uh, if you are right, and I don't want to com comment this, but if you are right, then, of course, the question is, I mean, the, I, I think you won't believe that we would immediately or very soon uh, uh, come to a point where we have a a market-based uh, interest rate setting. I think this is, sounds, at least here for, for the major part of it, it's a very long-term project, I guess, or um, uh, unless it, it might happen via a huge big crisis or shock or revolution or whatever, yeah? But um, uh, so, so, so we would have to keep with going on with central banks or somebody who sets prices and interest rates but what would, would the perfect interest rate in, in your mind? I mean, do you think that, uh, of course, I, I, I assume that you would think that we should continue to, to, to rise interest rates, but how fast and, and to what point would you think is, is this a part of the solution? Okay, so I'll, I'll come to those in turn. First of all, the correlation does not imply causation argument. So again, that's why today I started off with an a priori argument about what we would expect to see. So this isn't just finding a random correlation like the consumption of uh, expensive chocolate and GDP per capita and coming to the conclusion that, oh, if we all eat more expensive chocolate, GDP per capita will go up. Of course, it's, you know, it's the other way around. Um, so we begin by hypothesizing the interest rates are a pricing mechanism and that if that pricing mechanism is distorted by central bank policies, then that will lead to certain distortions in the economy. So those four or five slides at the beginning, that was an a priori argument saying this is what we'd expect to see. In fact, I would say, if I have a criticism of the Austrian school, I do have a lot of criticisms of the Austrian school. Perhaps the main one is that it's too a priori. So they, many in the Austrian school tend to just make assertions um, without backing it up with a lot of data. So that's what I've done here, is used a lot of data over quite a few countries to back it up. So, so it really isn't just looking at uh, finding a couple of interesting correlations here. Uh, it's also worth noting, in particular, we looked at each different sector uh, that's of importance here, that we would predict a priori would be affected, and they all have these same patterns. So if you remember, we started off with the relation and the divergence between credit and savings, 
That's the first thing I predicted, or that the Austin School would predict we'd see. And again, we saw the pattern. We then looked at asset bubbles and several different types of asset bubbles. Um, we also looked at whether those asset bubbles are being caused by excess credit creation. Um, and then we also looked at bond markets. Uh, we looked at it both in absolute terms, what's going on in the bond market and the ratios within bond portfolios. And then we looked at productivity, all of the key areas. And we found that all of these different areas show the same pattern, okay? Um, so we could write pages of econometrics explaining this, but it's basically just going to explain uh, in a more mathematical way what you're seeing on the screen here, which is all of these different areas are exhibiting the same pattern. And all of these areas are exactly what we would predict a priori uh, before even looking at the data would be the consequence of setting interest rates artificially low. So, yeah, it goes well beyond just um, correlation and causation. Um, I, anyway, I think that's the key, the, the most important part of what you, of what you just asked. Anyway, another part was, what do we do here? How do we raise interest rates? Uh, so, again, you said what would be the appropriate interest rate I mean, it's like saying what's the appropriate price of honey, what's the appropriate price of coffee. The appropriate price is that it reflects demand and supply, okay? So what we need, we've had chronically low savings rates over a generation um, or, uh, uh, as a result of artificially low interest rates. You've seen we've had chronically and disastrous increases in debt during this period. So one way or another, they need to balance out. Uh, just like the demand and supply of any other good in the economy. So rather than saying what interest rates should central banks set things at, to me we just need to move to free market interest rates, and that's what will solve the problem. You know, if we were in Venezuela and they said, we've got all these food shortages caused by low, artificially low food prices, what price should we set food at? You know, again, we're back to Ludwig Erhard at the end of World War II. And what did he do? He, you know, he just allowed prices to be set by the market, and that's what will solve the problem. What? Interest rates did not allow to set by the market. Correct. Fully Correct, but he was not in charge of the central bank anyway, so he couldn't have done that. Uh, but that's what, we're, that's what we're arguing here, is that interest rates are analogous to other prices in the economy and should be set by the market. Well, the question is actually, what is the role of central banks in the future? How will they adapt? How will we see central banks in, say, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Uh, what what is their task, what is their mandate. Um, we are now all critically looking at the mandate, price stability, financial market stability. Uh, have we kind of fixed this problem or solved this problem? If we are honest, definitely not. Um, so there is kind of rolling up the sleeves and a lot of work that needs to be done. But uh, will Austrian School explain everything? Well, but we have two more questions before we kind of Discuss this over a good glass of wine, <laughs> please. Let's, let's take the question of the gentleman a step further, Max. Um, you are luckily sitting in Austrian National Bank and telling them that there should be a market interest rate when they are the monopolists who are setting the artificially low interest rate, so that shows you that we are very liberal in Austria. Uh, however, to have a market interest rate, we need a market, which means if there's just a monopolist, how can there be a market? Now, in the UK, in the 80s, as you know, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, whom I actually hated at the time, funnily enough, but she liberalized the telecom sector. It started like the center bank as a monopolist, and today we have internet, cheap telephony, everything. Do you see anywhere in the world, let's say apart from Austria, where this type of uh, development is being advanced? I think um, there's increasing interest in the consequences of interest rate manipulation. At the, at the Cobden Centre we've done a lot, a lot of seminars over the years. Um, so if I'm, um, next month I'm doing another seminar at the OECD. And I think a few years ago people were interested in the consequences of artificially set interest rates, but it was quite theoretical. I think now there's more and more notice being taken. And I suspect when, when the debt defaults really pick up um, of this last phase, again, one of the key graphs we looked at today was bond quality. 
Okay? That's an important aspect of all of these bubbles. So when we look at a substantial number of all of the bonds and bond portfolios are going to be defaulting over the next couple of years, uh, that's where I think the interest in these issues will really increase. It often takes a crisis, in fact it almost always takes a crisis, for policymakers to, to really take notice. Um, yeah, it's brilliant to be able to talk about this at the Austrian Central Bank, um, especially with the, with the history going back uh, more than 100 years of Austrian school thinkers. It's absolutely terrific. And so we've got to hope, really, that this leads to, to more institutions taking an interest. Uh, because to me, this is, uh, this is so crucial uh, in terms of explaining what's happened over the last 30 years and what's going to happen. I mean, if it is as bad as the Austrian school would predict over the next two, three, four years with mass bond defaults, which will be worse than 2008, People are going to be frightened. People are going to unfortunately start looking for some bad solutions because that's what happened. Uh, that's what always happens during a terrible recession. So hopefully, we'll be able to explain both to policymakers and to the public at large that the, these are the arguments. These are the, the widespread consequences of, of the setting of interest rates. It, you know, it affects so many topics of discussion, from house prices to blowing up pension funds in Britain, to me it all comes back to the setting of interest rates. Next question. So we have three more questions and then we close it and the rest will be done outside. One, two, three. Thank you for oh, a very four, nice... Sorry, four, yes, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, let me preface by saying that by no means I'm a big fan of big governments and centralized decision making when it's virtually impossible to aggregate all the information that would be necessary to make those decisions, um, like in the case of interest rates. Um, but on the other hand, I think that nowadays we have a, a very centralized productivity. Um, like in the United States, for instance, even though we have more or less some growth in productivity or more or less stable, even if it's decreasing a bit, we have a labor market decreasing uh, quite substantially, which means that there's an increasing amount of people that just cannot join the labor market or be in productive enough to, to meet uh, ends meet. Um, so my question is, you will have an increasing um, percentage of the population that by not being able to participate in the market, they will demand more and more support from governments, subsidies, etc. And even though I'm not a big fan of subsidies as an incentive um, structure, how do you think that plays out? Because to, 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 increase, to, to allow the market to decide for itself, it also may not be very, very um, realistic in terms of how, how will people join the market? I'm, I'm not presuming that this is an easy question, but uh, <laughs> how do you see Austrian economics play a role in this dynamic? You know, so if we, if we think about a particular sector then, there, there. Uh, housing. So we're saying, will, will, will people demand subsidies because they don't have access through market mechanisms, and housing is the classic example. And it's, um, it's, it's really the most tragic example um, because, again, so many young people just can't afford houses, and, um, and people who are, who are older who bought their houses, let's, especially in Britain, if they bought their houses in the early 1980s, you know, they may have bought it for a few thousand pounds somewhere in London, and they're now sitting on an, an asset of more than a million pounds. Um, for most young people, they can't afford to get a mortgage on a million pound house. Um, so then you say, well, is this, will the demand then be for subsidies? And again, that's also what they've done in the UK. So there's various mechanisms, help to buy, which supposedly helps young people get on the property ladder, quote unquote. And, um, you know, it's, it, in essence, it's fueling this bubble even more. Uh, so. So again, the solution to that, if we, had, if we had market interest rates, the amount of credit available to flow into mortgages 
would be drastically reduced. Um, so it would be, the, the house prices would come down very substantially. Uh, and so again, that's what widens access is, is the falling house prices. So yeah, they're, they're treating, they're, they're in essence causing a problem with low interest rates and then making it even worse by subsidizing people to buy houses. Uh, so of course, from an Austrian school perspective, what we would want to do is treat the underlying problem, which is the artificially low interest rates. Well, incentives to save have lacked and have, have missed over the past 15, 20 years. And that's, that's a main problem, I, if I may mm, yeah, just yeah. say this, add but that. My point was it's increasingly harder, I'm sorry, it's increasingly harder for a lot of people yeah. to make money. So to join the, 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 the labor market, mm. the, like the threshold of productivity that is necessary to justify a company paying uh, a salary is increasingly higher. And we've seen that it's not very easy for a lot of people to, to meet the threshold that is increasing qu quite uh, substantially. So, so I think especially, as you say, for young people, yeah, there's a lot of people um, who work hard and get a degree and end up working at McDonald's or something. Um, it's quite widespread. Again, look, some of these things have a lot of different causes. Uh, so I don't want to oversimplify. But we did, of course, look at several pages on productivity. And we saw uh, as debt has increased, far from that debt being used for productive investment by companies, it's actually resulted in chronic lack of productivity, falling productivity with the metrics that we looked at. So of course, a company with falling productivity, it does not want to hire, hire more people, uh, and especially young people. So yeah, I mean, the youth unemployment in many countries is, is terrible. Many young people who do have jobs, it's not fun jobs where they would want to be doing it for the next 50 years. So yeah, it's, again, it's just very difficult to disentangle how much of this is due to 0% interest rates and the other things we've been looking at. Well, um, but I well, would argue quite a lot of it. I would not go into the labor markets right now because this would be a co completely different discussion yes. and we would have to look into some philosophies as well. Um, I, we actually have two more minutes. So uh, I ask you to keep your answers short and I ask the three gentlemen who have the three last questions to keep them short as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be quick. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to ask you um, how would you go about to uh, construct a mechanism by which interest rates could be set by the market without um, going into uh, like private uh, credit or the creation of um, proxy currencies by private corporations? Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so there's a number of different ways that it can be done. And of course, one of those ways is with private money, which is happening at the moment with decentralized finance. Um, but let's take it, be more traditional and look at how central banks might achieve it. I think it would have to, uh, I mean, you could do it using shock therapy effectively, like Erhard did after World War II and like was done in, in um, Eastern and Central Europe uh, in the early 90s where almost overnight you allow prices to be set by the market. But I suspect the optimal way of doing it would be to announce that we were moving to a regime of free market interest rates over time, explain why this needs to be done, uh, that it's been done in every other sector of the economy with different types of prices, and then that would then take place uh, over uh, perhaps over three to five years, even something like that. Um, whereby there would be less and less intervention in the pricing mechanism. Now, this also impacts a lot of other ways in terms of how banking is structured in a regulatory sense, in terms of central bank reserves, um, capital ratios. So the whole thing, to, to a certain degree, would need to be restructured. But actually, that's, that's not so bad anyway. I mean, we, if we look at some of the Basel rules, I've done a series of interviews at the Cobden Centre, I'll be very quick now, um, yeah. but with Lord Turner, for instance, who is the chief regulator in the UK, and we looked at how the Basel rules can make things worse anyway. But that, that's a quick answer, is that I think rather than doing shock therapy, we would need to move towards free market interest rates over three to five years. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you if you considered uh, 
uh, a constant level of population in different countries, and uh, which is uh, somehow uh, contradictive to the growth of population in the world. And for instance, if you look at Africa, uh, or you may look at uh, internet with two words, World Bank slash population, and you can see that the population in the world has increased by double since 1973 about. It means there had been four billion people before, and now we have to double. And naturally, there is the main part of it are young people. So for instance, Africa has about 20% of the population is younger than 22 years. And actually, they have to try to grow up, to earn money, and so on. And when parents have nine children, you know, there's no chance, to, not even to sustain them. Mm -hmm. So they look for different ways. And so therefore, the I saw in your diagrams the split, uh, splitting up the difference between the different uh, trends, mm -hmm. uh, widening and widening. Okay. okay, so demographics is an interesting component of this. And <clears throat> we're in serious demographic problems in much of the developed world, as we know. Uh, there's a lot of different causes to this, but if we specifically look at it relative to what we're talking about today, a precursor to a lot of what we've discussed today is Japan. The bubble burst in around 1990 or so. They went to 0% interest rates in QE, um, and they effectively began a demographic collapse. So again, if you, if you think about the fall in demographics in the developed world, um, many people want to own their own house before they have kids. And so that, I think, is a major factor. So again, it comes back to what the gentleman here was talking about, how young people today often have pretty rubbish jobs, even if they're graduates, even if they have master's degrees. It's not like their parents. They can't afford a house. You know, in the UK, a huge proportion of their monthly meagre income goes on rent. So why, how could they even have kids? And so a lot of that is to do with these asset bubbles that have been inflated, but particularly in housing. Um, there are other factors as well. For instance, even among reasonably wealthy people, if I think about like a, a lot of my friends, let's say maybe seven figure net worth, we're not talking about super rich, okay? But it's, um, in Britain, certainly, and in other developed countries, there's also just a lot of disincentives for men to get married um, and end up you know, being asset stripped in the divorce courts. Uh, that's a completely separate issue, but this uh, certainly uh, among a lot of people that I talk to at the moment. So I think there's a lot of different factors, but I think it does tie into, in particular, interest rates, and I think Japan was the precursor to this. In, in many ways, Japan was the precursor to a lot of what we're seeing here. <coughs> Zero percent interest rates, QE. Again, people thought it was bizarre during the 1990s in the West looking at what was going on in Japan, but it's now all been, it's all fed over to what's going on in the West. Uh, and, and including the demographic issues that they've had in Japan. Last question. Last question. Short. Uh, recently I've read that uh, the exchange rate between the Deutsche, uh, Deutsche Mark and the Reichsmark in 1948 was 1 to 13 under uh, Erhard. Erhard. So, uh, and, and you, now we have seen that the balance sheet of ECB increased the last uh, 20 years by 1 to 13, I think. So, uh, 1 to 10 or 1 to 9. So, uh, the question is, will we have a monetary uh, reform in Euroland in the next years? Well, will we have monetary reform in Euroland? Again, I think when the next crisis hits, they'll be forced to do something. But again, as I, as I concluded with the talk, I suspect, 
I think inflation will come down, okay, when, the, when, the, when this debt bubble bursts, when this situation of the debt bubble bursts. I think inflation, if you think about 2008, everyone was talking about inflation in mid-2008. Uh, uh, petrol prices have gone up and so on. But the moment the, the debt default started in late 2008, the concern was then deflation. I think the same will happen here. So, you know, answer, direct answer to your question, will Euroland need to do monetary reform? I suspect when this next crisis hits with the substantial debt defaults over the next couple of years, I think they'll probably go right back to 0% interest rates and negative interest rates and even more negative interest rates, lower than they were last time. That will at least buy another few years of this system before they have to seriously reform. Uh, but again, these ideas are now floating around. Uh, and it's, you know, it's great to be able to speak here today on this. And more and more people are becoming interested in monetary reform. And I think that's what will change things. So interest in free market interest rates, interest in the Chicago plan, interest in private forms of money, all of these things really, I think will play a part. Uh, but in general, if you look at political institutions, reform usually needs to be forced on them, usually through a crisis. Thank you very much, Max. Um, there is more questions open and pending than answers around. Uh, the central bank here, the Austrian central bank, does a lot of research on that front. Uh, they have great economists, they do a lot uh, looking into the single issues and trying to combine a big, um, a big solution or bringing, uh, bringing various solutions that, need, that will be discussed on the, on the floors. And uh, I would say MMT is gone. Uh, long live the Austrian school and new, new ideas out of the Austrian school because as well the Austrian school has to further advance and has to further uh, innovate itself as well and we need young people who challenge that constantly and thank you all for being here and I would like to invite you on behalf of the governor for a drink outside and discuss with Max Rangeli. Thank, thank you very you much. Very much. Thank you.